So my title of my talk is What's Past as Prolog, or Two Things I Learned from Alex Stepanoff. Um, and that title actually comes from a Shakespeare play, The Tempest. And it's uh, a scene where one character is talking to another about um, how he should kill his brother and um, take, take uh, his brother's place as king of Naples. And so there's kind of two interpretations of this phrase, what's past this prologue, that shows up in this quote. And the two parts of my talk are kind of going to reflect those two interpretations. So the first interpretation, the one that you most commonly hear, is that what that means is everything that's happened up till now is what's brought us to this point. And in order to understand what we're going to do next, you have to understand the past. And that's a view that any of you who know Alex uh, know that he probably would share. Um, if you've worked with Alex, if you've read his books, if you've taken his classes, if you've even had a five-minute conversation with him, you probably know he really venerates the great ideas of the past and the, and the thinkers of the past. And so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, for just a few minutes about some of those examples of learning from the past. Um, we've already heard um, reference to some of them. The, um, the Egyptian multiplication algorithm, which uh, may or may not be shown here. This is the Rhine papyrus, but I'm not sure if that's actually showing the multiplication algorithm. Um, but the Egyptian multiplication algorithm um, being used for power, um, Euclid's GCD algorithm, um, and many other things. Um, kind of my favorite example is just the whole um, idea of generic programming and concepts, which now, when Alex talks about it, he doesn't talk about himself as inventing these ideas. He talks about Aristotle as inventing these ideas, or Simon Stevin or Emmy Nurter uh, inventing all these ideas and putting them together, and each one building on um, what's been done in the past. A specific example um, we use in the book we did together, which I know Alex has talked about in his past courses as well, is um, the RSA uh, encryption algorithm. And a lot of the security we take for granted today, things like um, electronic credit card transactions, um, are based on RSA or, or an algorithm like that. And that, in turn, was made possible by um, number theory work done by Fermat uh, hundreds of years ago. So this is a great example of something where um, a key idea and a key thinker from the past is essential to understanding um, what we're doing today. I want to talk about, uh, very briefly, a, another area where um, things were built on from the past, and that's library classification. So um, libraries have been around for a long time. They've been around since, uh, uh, well, thousands of years. Um, and early library classification schemes were a little bit haphazard, but um, they generally had the idea that, well, some books are about some things, or they weren't books originally. They were tablets and scrolls. But, um, and then later in, in Roman times, for example, they would have a section of the library with Greek books and a section of the library with Roman books. And then in, in medieval days, there might be secular books and sacred books. Um, and eventually, um, people started to realize that you should use knowledge classification to organize things. And Francis Bacon had a, a classification of knowledge into three areas that was very influential. And eventually, you got um, this guy, Melville Dewey, in the 19th century, who put together two different ideas, the knowledge classification idea with the idea that the code should actually tell you how to find the book in the library. Um, and so that led to kind of the, the library classification systems that we're used to today. Um, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, but just kind of put that in the back of your head as an example of how to build on the ideas of the past. Now, a problem that uh, Alex and I worked on together with Anil Gangoli, Ryan Ernst, and Pram Oberoi um, at A9 was the problem of integer encoding. And this is a little different from library classification, but it's another important problem that comes up in search. Um, in a search engine, you have this data structure called an inverted index, which is basically a list of words. And for each word, you point to a list of every document that contains that word. And we represent the documents by um, ID numbers, generally uh, large integers. And then if you um, replace the integers with deltas, sort of the difference between the last integer you saw and the next one, you can make the numbers smaller. But what good does it do to make the number smaller? Well, it's useful if you can store small integers in less space than big integers. So that's the problem we're working on. And there are all these different ways to do that. Um, the details aren't important, but the, they, they get down to the bit level. So different formats have different bit representations and ways to, to store small integers in less space than large integers. Um, and you'll notice in, in these two uh, formats, there are some data bits. That's where the actual data is. And then there are these other bits which we call descriptor bits in general, that describe the data and tell you how long it is or, or how to find the next part. So the problem we had was um, 
the people out there had worked on all these different techniques, but there was sort of nothing to do with each other. They used different nomenclature, they used different terminology, they um, didn't make the same assumptions, and when we were trying to improve on this, it was kind of a struggle to figure out how to move forward. Until we looked at an idea um, from the past, um, again going back to Aristotle, which is the idea of a taxonomy. And we realized that the descriptor bits gave us a taxonomy of all of these different encoding schemes. And you could classify them according to different dimensions, whether the descriptor bits um, represented a number in unary or binary, the length that is, um, whether they talked about an individual integer or a group of integers, and whether they were all packed together into one byte or split across several bytes. And once we saw that, a light kind of went on and we said, well, if these are the dimensions of the taxonomy, there must be there must be solutions that live in those empty boxes there, in the empty space. And in fact, we developed um, two of them uh, and, and found solutions because we looked at that taxonomy. And in fact, um, one of those new formats won and, and was the best performing of anything that had been published up to that time. So it was a great example of building on this idea from the past in order to make progress in the present. Okay, now I'm coming to my second point, which is um, the other interpretation of my title, of the past is prologue. And this interpretation you can think of as maybe saying, as the quote being, what's past is mere prologue. Because maybe what that one character is saying to the other character when he says he should kill his brother is, you know, it doesn't matter what happened before. What matters is what you do now. Um, and so there's a history, there's a tradition of people being stuck on an old idea and needing to get past it. And the reason I put this picture, I never imagined, by the way, that this picture would show up twice today. But if you notice uh, Plato there, that's the same one that was in Sean's talk. Um, but what I really want to talk about here was Aristotle, who's the guy in blue. And the reason I want to mention him is that um, in the Middle Ages, when Aristotle's works were rediscovered, um, the people who, who rediscovered him um, kind of got obsessed with Aristotle, and they, they decided that he was not only the most important philosopher, but they actually referred to him as the philosopher. And they started analyzing his works and memorizing them and, and trying to do everything that he said. But they kind of missed the point of his, his, his approach. So when Aristotle said, um, I learned about uh, the way fish work or the way planets move or the way things, whatever happen in the, in the real world, by going out and observing them, Instead of these people in the Middle Ages going out and observing them themselves, they just wrote down whatever Aristotle said about them. So they were stuck in the past in a way that they maybe shouldn't have been. So if you're going to overcome the past, how, how do you do it? Well, there's three different ways um, I can think of off the top of my head. Um, one of them is you can just reject it. You can say, OK, look, I, I understand what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I disagree with you. Um, and a great example of that that Alex has talked about is Lobachevsky rejecting um, the traditional assumptions about geometry and saying, look, non-Euclidean geometry is just as valid as Euclidean geometry. You may think I'm crazy, but I think this is just as valid. And the second way you can try to overcome the past is by starting with a different set of constraints. So you can say, yes, I agree with you. Your solution is great for the time and the place and the situation where you came up with it. But I'm in a different time and a different place and a different situation. And an example of that, um, again, it's mentioned both in, in our book and in, in Elements of Programming, is Yossi Stein coming up with a new approach to um, greatest common divisor after thousands of years, coming up with a new algorithm and saying, look, the, the constraints I have have to do with how long it takes me to do certain instructions on the computer. And I only have access to that computer for an hour a week. This is 1960 computers. That wasn't much time. So that different constraint gives you a different solution. And the third thing is you can just take this uh, kind of beginner's mind approach. There's this, this notion in Zen Buddhism called Shoshin. Um, and the idea is to not make any assumptions and pretend you don't know anything about the problem. Or maybe you really don't know anything about the problem. And when you don't know what you can do, you also don't know what you can't do. And you often come up with a different solution. Now, uh, because I said all these things about how much Alex values the past, you might think that he's not a fan of these um, kind of iconoclastic approaches. But I think you'd be wrong. Um, if you look at, for example, um, his work on the C++ standard template library, he's often said, this is never meant to be exhaustive. He'd love it if other people added to the C++ template library or came up with new solutions. And there are even cases in here, um, he likes to tell a story about how um, 
one of the functions he developed was clearly meant to be temporary, and he actually wrote a piece of uh, a comment that said, this is temporary. You have to fix it. You have to replace this piece of code. And so what did the people do who, who took his implementation and, and published it? They removed the comment instead of <laughs> actually fixing the code. But even if we ignore that, that special case, um, if you talk to Alex now, and he's written about this, he's, he's spoken about this in interviews recently, um, he says, many of the things I did then, I would do differently today. It's 20 years later. Um, for example, um, link structures would probably play a much smaller role in STL than they did at the time, because times have changed. And in fact, uh, that's the same thing we found in our integer encoding problems. So we had made all these assumptions that we had learned from textbooks or from our past experience about what the right way to do things was. Um, and they were things like, uh, you shouldn't waste any computation. Um, you can't do unaligned reads. You shouldn't read any data you don't actually need, because reads are expensive, I.O. is expensive, and so on. And what we found was, because of the changes in processor architecture, because of things like deep pipelines and caches and, and parallel instructions and the cost of branch misprediction, um, it was actually better to read a bunch of data we didn't need and then throw it away. And in fact, it was in the, the winning solution, the winning encoding format that I touched on earlier, um, there were times when we read 10 times as much data as we needed and threw it away, and that was still cheaper than stopping to decide if you need to read the next byte. So the constraints that you have today could really influence um, the problem that you're solving. So let's come back to library classification. Now this guy, a lot of people may not know him, S. R. Ranganathan, um, he was trained as a mathematician in India, and he had published a couple of papers, and they asked him in the 20s if he'd be willing to become the first librarian of the, um, the university library at Madras. And he didn't really want to do this because he didn't know anything about libraries. And they said, well, look, we'll send you to library school. We'll send you to the UK to library school. And then when you come back, you decide if you still want to take the job. So he went to University College London, which is the only library school with a graduate program in the UK at the time. And he took his classes, and they taught him all about the stuff I mentioned earlier, about Bacon and, and Dewey and this hierarchy of knowledge and all this stuff. And he said, wait a second. That's totally wrong. That makes no sense at all. That's not the way books are. This book isn't just about India or just about history or just about technology. It's about all those things. And so he actually designed an entirely new classification scheme called column classification, which today we would call faceted indexing. And he's really the father of faceted indexing. So I want to close with um, something that's personally important to me. And I think it's another example of um, where this thinking might be useful. And that's search engine user experience. So many of you may not know this, but search engines did exist before the web. In fact, they, they go back to the 1950s and 60s. Um, and they were generally hard to use. And they had very arcane um, instructions and so on. And then eventually, there was a, a lot of progress. And it kind of culminated in the first web search engines. And the first web search engines came about around 1994. Where's Brian? Um, web crawler was the first full text web search engine, which Brian Pinkerton um, developed. And there were others at the time. You've probably heard of some. And those search engine designers were facing these constraints. This is the kind of computer that people had about then. 120 megahertz Pentium, one megabyte of memory, probably a 28K modem, which is sort of like sucking data through a tiny straw. And an operating system like Windows 3.1. And so they said, well, if I'm going to design a search engine that people are going to actually be able to use, I have to think about those constraints. Those are the constraints that my users have. So, they're gonna, so, so what they did was they said, well, let's pass sort of the minimal amount of data we could possibly send along down that tiny straw so that someone will be able to make a decision about which result to look at. And they designed it, and it looked sort of like this. This is AltaVista, um, which was um, partly designed by people who worked in the building that A9, one of the buildings A9 is in today. So that was their solution for the constraints of 1996. So it's 20 years later. And this is what our computers are like today. We have over 50 times the processing power. We have 8,000 times the memory. We have 300 times the bandwidth. And we have operating systems that have these enormously rich APIs that can do sort of transparency and audio and video and animation and all these wonderful things. And so if you were starting with those constraints, what search engine UI would you design? It was user experience. Would it be that one? That's what we have today. 
So I would argue that these people have been a little bit stuck in the past and could use a dose of this philosophy. So in conclusion, um, Alex likes to talk about the relationship between theory and practice and how they're really two sides of the same coin. You don't really know what's going to be practically useful when you're designing it or when you're coming up with the ideas, and so you have to look at both. Everyone has to be familiar with theory and, and practice. And I think the same thing is true of learning from the past and overcoming the past. Thanks very much.